Bobby Regan, Chair of the City Club's Forum Board. For more than a century, the City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people work together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live and explore. We're gathered today at the Sentinel Hotel and are joined by thousands of Oregonians via X-ray, FM's radio stations, KGW's website, Facebook feed, and news app, and Open Signal's community media television stations. In addition to the City Club's valued media partners, our corporate sponsors enable us to continue to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to recognize City Club's winter sponsor, Portland General Electric, and thank them for their generous support. Please join me in showing our appreciation to the sponsor, staff, and volunteers who have made this event possible. I'm looking forward to today's conversation because reliable news is fundamental to our ability to function as a democracy. And yet, it's clear that the current models for who reports the news and how it reaches us are in trouble. The term fake news is everywhere now, but has become a paradox. It both describes the lies that we hear more frequently from national leaders and yet is used by those same leaders as a tool to undermine the media in general and the truth. Meanwhile, with shrinking newsrooms in Oregon and across the country, the information that we need to determine what is real or fake is often going unreported. The newspaper editors and publishers here with us today have always acted as a counterweight to mainstream media, picking up stories that the others aren't paying attention to. But as the media landscape shifts, their role may also be shifting. Let's turn to our panel to find out. Joining us today are Bernie Foster, the founder and publisher of The Scanner News. He has served on the boards of many organizations, including the West Coast Black Publishers Association, the Portland Chamber of Commerce, the Leaders Roundtable, and the Northwest YMCA. He also previously served on the Oregon State Banking Board and the Oregon State Board of Pharmacy. Joanne Zuhl is executive editor of Street Roots, Portland's nonprofit newspaper focusing on social, economic, and environmental justice. Her career in journalism as a reporter and editor spans more than 25 years. She previously served as a board member and vice chair of the International Network of Street Papers. Melanie Davis, publisher of El Hispanic News, planned to be with us today, but had to cancel this morning due to weather-related issues. Moderating our discussion today is Michelle Cole, a partner and communication strategist for Gallatin Public Affairs. Prior to joining Gallatin, Michelle served as the Capitol Bureau Chief for the Oregonian, where she reported on the Oregon legislature, state government, and politics. She earned the Bruce Baer Award, Oregon's top award for investigative reporting, and her peers honored her work with several first place awards from the Society of Professional Journalists. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Good afternoon. It's so great to see you all here today. It's cold outside and the Friday before summer break. So uh, thank you for coming out. I think we have a really interesting panel. I'm sorry Melanie couldn't make it. I pre-interviewed, like a good reporter does, uh, my panel before. And they have some really interesting observations about uh, journalism today. So I'm just going to get started um, with a question that I would like to ask both uh, Bernie and Joanne, To um, starting with Bernie. can you? Tell us, uh, take a minute to tell us your founding story. Um, how did your publication get started and why? Who's your audience? First of all, let me, let me thank everybody. I want to thank the City Club. I want to thank you as well. But also, I want to also recognize an individual from my organization, uh, Jerry Foster, also my brother. Jerry, would you stand up? Uh, speaking of getting started, Jerry is probably one of the reasons that we still exist today. Uh, because Jerry is a 
as our advertising director, and, and those of you know that newspapers, commercial newspaper, which we are, is uh, ran off advertising. And the, uh, probably the only one I know that really know how to make, make advertising work is probably some, some of the new Google search engines. They are, they are really cutting into the uh, format of our paper. But getting back to your question as to why we started, we started because we felt we had a, a voice. We started 40, 43 years ago. And the reason we started, there was nobody at that time telling our story. And for those of you that have been living in Portland for the last 40 or 45 years, you know and I know, at that time, people like me couldn't go past 33rd Avenue. So that was a major thrust. My background came out of the, uh, out of the marketing part of the newspaper. So we really wanted to focus on telling our story. Telling our story because it wasn't told during that time. At that time, the only person of color you would see had to be in handcuffs, basically. And, that, and that's a true story. We wanted to focus on the life, the educational, the problems, and there's still a problem today. The problem of what's, what's going on in Portland, what's going on in the national, and by the way, what affects us nationally really trickles down to us locally as well. Unemployment, um, police brutality, uh, drugs, uh, disproportionately uh, the prison system. Uh, as a matter of fact, for those of you that have been in here some time, you know the second highest concentration of black males in the OSP, Oregon State Penitentiary, other than Portland. So what do we do about it? Well, our job, and I always said it to our writers, is to focus and put a light on it. And if you put enough light on it, uh, major newspapers and others will pick it up. And, and that happened in, a, in many, many of our cases. And so, so if you want to. I'm sorry, Joanne. No, that's okay. You I'm, told me I'm, I'm allowed to, to do off. this, everyone. I, 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 that, was good. <laughs> that was good. Um, so Street Roots started, next year will be our 20th anniversary. So we started 20 years ago uh, as uh, much as what Bernie is talking about here for the same reasons. We wanted to be heard. And when I say we, we're talking about people who were experiencing homelessness in Portland. Uh, and this, at the time, was a group of a, a small group of people, about five, six people got together. They were homeless. They came together and says, we want to have a voice. And one of the great ways of having a voice is having your own newspaper. So with that, they started, uh, built off of the Burnside Cadillac and built Street Roots. Um, so time passes, uh, attention gets drawn to what we're doing, to the issues that are going on, to speaking from the street level and not from city hall uh, and the halls of justice downward, but from the streets up. And so where we are today is we sell 10,000 papers every week. We have 170 vendors instead of just the five original who've all moved on. We have uh, a small staff, but an incredible staff. We have this phenomenal pool of uh, freelancers, uh, journalists who come to our organization because they want to cover very important issues. They don't want to just write the short story, the punchy story, the clickbait, as it were, and get in and out. But they really are dedicated to the social justice issues that we report on. So that has been our trajectory to where um, you know, I'm very proud of the organization and the people involved in it. Just quick follow-up for both of you. Who's your audience, Bernie? Um, we talked a lot about what the audience was when black newspapers started. Um, who's your audience today? Today my, today, my audience are mostly 35, between 35, that's, that's how, 35 and about 60, which is mostly females. That's, that's our highest uh, high demographics. And then we have a sprinkle of, of um, others in between. But that's our major, major number. Are they all African American? I'm guessing not. Oh, absolutely not. Um, let me just say that to today, with the new internet and all the other, other things that I said earlier, we probably have the largest audience that I ever had in my life for readership. However, the revenue has went down. 
And the, and the reason the revenue has went down because of the, uh, this new technology. And I was talking to some of the young people earlier today. They're in a, they're in a good position because it's, it's a new demographic way of, of things are happening. But at the same time, you've got to recognize the audience and how do you, how do you capitalize on the, all that readership? Well, I think one of the few companies in the world that understand that is, is Google and Facebook. They, they really uh, captured the market. And um, I was just saying earlier, about 15 years ago, I was, I was I pretty close to have about over, over a million readers. The day it has went down because Google and those people changed the algorithm. And, and you don't know, they don't tell you when they change it, you got to build it over again. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so to me, it's a constant, constant moving. So, so what you have to do, you just have to be real innovative. Um, a good example, I, I'll tell you, a, a good innovative website is, is the Drudge, the Drudge Report. You ever saw that? Very innovative, a simple little website. So for me, it's not, it's not very difficult. If you see a good model, you're trying to emulate it. So if you go on our website, you'll see the Scanner Report. And that basically all of the uh, black-owned newspapers in the country, as well as other local media newspaper, back, back we, we, we divided into five regions. And all of that is little weekly newspapers that don't have a voice. That, so we're building that, and we just launched that Thursday, so it's thescannerreport.com. So breaking news, everybody. <laughs> Joanne, real quick, who's your audience? You said 10,000 uh, printed papers, who's reading it? Oh. We need to better know that, honestly. We're gonna be doing some reports on that, but sur surveys that we've done in the past have shown that this is, uh, you know, it's largely sold downtown or outside mm -hmm. of uh, nice grocery stores like Whole Foods and New Seasons. Mm -hmm. um, it's often people making affluent people, uh, people who are commuting to downtown and work in, uh, all levels of either government, social services. So it's it's a mix of people, but uh, you know, a vendor could stand here and tell you every one of their customers and talk about who buys the paper. So it'd be a mix of uh, economic levels and demographic levels. Let me let me ask you um, move on the question specifically for you because I'm I'm fascinated by stories. I know of one, and we talked about it that you broke. Um, that Street Roots broke and the mainstream media followed. Will you talk about that, Joanne? Uh, sure, um, and, and this was a story that Emily Green, our senior staff reporter who's here in the audience today, uh, broke open the story about uh, IP22, with a, which is an initiative petition that is being circulated by an organization that wants to remove our sanctuary status in our state, which is the language that says our local law enforcement, our peacekeepers are not gonna be cooperating with ICE officers to uh, round up and deport uh, undocumented immigrants. So it's a complex issue, but that in a nutshell. And what we found out was that uh, the people circulating this petition were uh, misinforming people about what it was about. The idea is to put it on the ballot uh, for people to vote on with the intention of having it removed from our Constitution. And they're telling people things like this, this is in order to preserve our sanctuary status, this is to keep Trump out of our state and controlling our sanctuary status or removing it, this is to protect our services. It was basically a whole turn on its head uh, information uh, statements to people signing the petition, and they were signing an error. Uh, they filed a complaint, one of them did, and perhaps more at this point, have complained, filed complaints with the Secretary of State's office to say, I was duped. And this is really significant, because this puts it on the ballot. This is also a felony offense to mislead voters. Um, and, and, and how, it's still how long did it take for uh, the other uh, mainstream media to catch up with you? Days, weeks? Well, I'm not sure they have, oh. I mean, to be. I mean, to be perfectly honest, there's not, I don't know that it has picked up a lot of traction. Some other small papers, PSU, small campuses, where this was going on have picked mm -hmm. it up. Um, I think it is going to get a lot more traction because I think these are the early days of something that's a pretty big deal. Interesting. Bernie, you and I talked a little bit about uh, the Jefferson 
story as far as a, a story that you took on and, and broke the, I'm thinking about the naming poll that you did. Would you please talk about that and how it reflects on how you're serving your audience? And Well, we, uh, we ran a, took a quick survey about two weeks ago out of about 400 respondents. And it was the basic, the basic of, of it was, uh, would you want to change the name of Jefferson? And it was quite interesting. Uh, the first week or so, it was, uh, it was running at about three to one that they wanted to change. But we cut it off last week, and uh, it ended up 71%, 70% said that they, did, they wanted to keep the name, 30% said change it. The school district ran their own little survey, and we did a little short piece. It's up on the website. Uh, so now that they are going to make a recommendation to keep Jefferson's name the same. Interesting. I, I think it's interesting credibility that your publication brought to that as well. I need to take a moment here, because I missed the first one, to read the moderator broadcast mention. Uh, for our broadcast audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Michelle Cole, Director of Content and Research at Gallatin Public Affairs. With me today are Bernie Foster, the publisher of The Scanner News, and Joanne Zuhl, the Executive Director of Street Roots. Um, Bernie, I'm going to come back to you and talk a little bit about um, reporting and whether there are occasions. Um, let's just say there was a leader in the community, the African American community, who um, was accused of some wrongdoing. Um, talk about whether you feel a publication like yours has a responsibility to go harder, softer, or how do you deal with a situation like that? Well, we think we deal with it as any other publication, and I can, I'll, I'll get into that specifics. Um, we, uh, there was a couple of articles oh, about a year ago uh, one of the city commissioners. Uh, one of the things we found out that a lot of the resources that come from city government sometimes doesn't necessarily reach down to us. And I remember there was a piece in one of the uh, one of the newspaper. It was talked about the fact that this particular commissioner had uh, given funds to uh, the Urban League as well as the, um, the self enhancement and so on and so forth. And they was criticizing her for that. Well, my response was, this is why we put her in, to advocate for our cause. What's wrong with people advocating for your is issues and putting funds into your resources? Because basically, you have not in the past. So we did an editorial piece on that. But then there were some other things that that commission kind of we didn't agree with. But but those are the kinds of things that we think is important. Um, Do you go easier or harder when, you're, when somebody comes seeking an editorial endorsement um, and, and they're black, they're a member of the community? Well, not, not necessarily. First of all, I don't endorse simply because you're black. Let me say that again. I don't endorse you simply because you're black. We encourage some of our black in, to, to be involved, but that is not a prerequisite. What you're going to do for this community. That's probably the most important element. Far too often, I think, in many cases, people get on boards and so forth. They get there just to further their resume. Well, I, I'm, I'm personally, the paper is not about that. What you're going to do. If it's difficult, find something else to do. I, I don't. I don't feel any apologetic because um, somebody w made it a little difficult. L and let me give you a good example. Although, and I'll ask you to make it a quick one so All I can right. get another question in for Joanne. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, we had a commissioner, and I won't call his name. We asked him, that's when they had the first source agreement or at the convention center. We said, okay, you want to do the first source agreement. If they want to build this convention center, we, if we put dollars into it, we want to have a first source of some of those jobs. But make a long story short, he said, well, if, if I do that, Bernie, um, Clackamas would be mad at me. Well, I'm mad at you now because you don't want to support <laughs> my issue. So that's what you're dealing with. Anyway, I'll, now, I'll shut up after that. 
Thank you. Joanne, there's been a lot of attention here in our city um, to economic inequality, lack of housing, uh, other issues. Can you talk a little bit about what impact Street Roots has had on this conversation? Um, I think we've had a lot of impact, and it's not it's not always the obvious impact. Um, I think, on, and there's levels, lots of stages to this, I believe. Then one of them is just over time, over these 19, 20 years now of covering these issues, that it um, it it has, I think, created this uh, collective humanization of populations that have not been noticed before or have not been listened to before. Do you think it would be different if you weren't around? Oh, I really think, yeah, absolutely. There are cities across this country where there are no street papers and there are no voices and movement and organizing around issues of being marginalized or uh, impoverished uh, or without housing, and they don't have, um, they have laws that ban camping outright. You can't be laying down anywhere. They have laws that say you can't feed the homeless. Um, that, that exists outside of our wonderful city and outside of our wonderful state. And, and I, I can't think that you can look at Portland and with all the covers that we've done around homeless issues and certainly now around larger social justice issues. Um, you know, we now have today a, a housing bond of $258 million that's going to build 1,300 apartments and homes, and most of half of them, I th almost, or almost half are going to go to families that make 30% or lower. I mean, the mm -hmm. hardest to house families. Um, we have laws that protect renters' rights. Um, we have conversations around what's going to happen on our streets and what really is important and significant around mental and physical health that address homelessness. And, and I, I have to think that we've been a part of that because when we were doing it 20 years ago, other newspapers weren't doing it or doing it differently, right? And today, other newspapers are doing it, and that's fantastic. Yes. You know, for better or worse, we are getting a lot more coverage, a lot more dialogue lot out more there attention. around issues of extreme poverty um, and just communities and populations living on the edge, right? We're, we're thinking about it much more. It's out there, it's prevalent, and we think about solutions much more because of that. And I think that's where we are today. And, I, and, and yes. <laughs> so I have a, a question. I'm, actually, I'm gonna ask you a question and I'll let you bounce off that. How's that? I, okay, I, I wanna bounce nah, off. No, go ahead. Go okay, I, I think she says some very significant. She talks about homeless. Um, in my district, we comprise about 3.5% of Portland population, but we have 70% 70 70 of renters. White America is about 35% renters. About a 35% difference. Hispanic is about 58. And Native American is about 58. So I'm simply saying, by you shining the light on that, it's really important uh, because I think it all, it's all of that ties in, and for me, it's about the fact that homelessness is, is a major problem, and renters is another major problem. Thank you. I think that's thank you for that. I want to talk about the future of journalism. We've lot, have a lot of students in the audience. Thank you, students. Um, first of all, as the media has changed, and in some ways, in in our city, we've seen it shrunk. Uh, or consolidated, are, are your models uh, the, the answer to clickbait journalism? Or talk a little bit about how you see your, your model evolving in the next 5, 10, 20 years. Bernie, you want to start? And then we'll go with Joanne after Well, that. it's like anything else. Um, business and, and newspapers are business as well. I, I don't have your model. And that might be, that might be the model. I, I don't know. But I do know that the model is changing, and I think newspaper will be around. It may not be as large as it is today or some of the, the way we saw it 15 years ago, but, but it'll be around. Print will always be around. And, and to, the, to the young people, learn to write, and it'll, it'll take you almost in any direction you want to go. Good, well-written article. So the model today, I, for us, we try and do a couple of things. One is that we try and run the paper at, on one side, and then on the other side, we build, it, we build a website. And uh, our, our website is catching on, but it's not as lucrative 
if I had my way, I would go back to the old way, because that was, uh, that was pretty lucrative. <laughs> if, if, you, if you want to raise your rate, nobody asks you about raising your rate. You say, okay, you just raise it. And, uh, that's a much different world today, right? It's different. They, <laughs> they, they want more. What you gonna do for this? If, if, I, if I keep you, Bernie, uh, what are you gonna give me? How do you sweeten the pie? Well, do I have to give you 15, uh, 15 additional uh, looks on the website? Do I have to run an extra ad for you? So it's, it's always constantly moving. So going back, and I think Jerry would agree, going back the old way was a lot easier because we all like the, the easy way, not the hard way. So Joanne, what do you think about your model, your print? Uh, you are you are online, but you're a print. You rely on that print edition, and I want you to talk about that. And what, do you think you're the savior of journalism? Papers like yours? Please say yes. That wasn't on the list of questions, <laughs> by the way. Um, uh, you know, we're we're a unique model in that you know the print copy is essential to what we do because the print copy is that interaction between the person who's selling the paper and buying the paper, and there's. Um, there's a value to that and a quality to it that not every paper possesses. You know, you take it out of a box or it lands on your doorstep. Uh, so that's an added value to that. And it's, it's, it, I, we could just have a whole show about that wonderful relationship with the vendors. Um, so we have that, but, but our website, um, which is fantastic, news.streetroots.org, um, is intended to uh, educate people more about what we do because I think for some people coming to town they see the vendor and they're very confused about what this is all about. There's that side of it but also directing people to buy the hard copy newspaper. So the news that goes up on our website is trickled out the week after the paper comes out. So we just came out with a new edition today. You can buy it about two blocks from here. Uh, and, the, and online, those stories will come out starting Monday, Wednesday, throughout the week. Uh, and finally, like Thursday, the main piece goes up, and the next Friday we have a new paper. So we don't want to compete with that sales model. Uh, but you know, the digital offers a different option. It does allow you to add to stories, uh, link and connect stories, package stories. So it's a little different beast. But. Do you think your model of journalism, do you go, this is a little bit of a, uh, a change from the question I asked Bernie, but do you write through a different filter? Do you think that you um, have an activist point of view when you write about social justice or poverty issues? Or um, give me a sense of the, the journalism standards that you, that you all bring, because your reporting is um, fairly deep. I spend a lot of time reading the reporting. Talk a little bit about where you might pull your punches or might have a different filter on a story. I don't think we ever pull punches. We're part of the Society of Professional Journalists. Uh, we adhere to the ethics. We have professional journalists on our staff and writing for us. I come from a mm -hmm. professional journalism background. I don't see our newsroom as any different from any other newsroom I've ever worked in or I know anybody else who's worked in in this town or any town. So in addition to that, we do come through the lens of writing about and uh, highlighting issues of social justice. So with that in mind, we're not gonna be covering the same stories you're gonna see in like a daily paper that is the paper of record, so to speak. We are gonna be going in deep on stories. We're not out there, um, we're not out there clawing and scratching trying to break a story. I mean, it was great with the IP22 issue, but when we're talking about stories around social justice and uh, covering marginalized populations, um, we're often, it's more a priority and a matter that we get the story out there and less that we're the first to get the story out there because more often than not, we're the only ones getting the story out there. So that's where our priority is. Great. Uh, for our broadcast audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Michelle Cole, Director of Content and Research at Gallatin Public Affairs. With me today are Bernie Foster, the publisher of The Scanner News, and Joanne Zuhl, the Executive Director of Street Roots. Bernie, I want to talk to you a little bit. You've mentioned advertising, and, and it's the lifeblood of keeping your organization, your newspaper, alive. Can you talk a little bit about, um, tell me the story when you wanted to join the Publishers Association early on, and then will you tell me if you feel like you're getting the slice of the advertising pie today that would naturally go to you, or are, you, are people still holding back? Well, uh, the last point, I, let me take that first. Are we getting our first share of it? Absolutely 
not. Now, so when having said that, that's going back, that's going back about 20 years ago when, when we first started. Uh, fortunately for me, I came from the, the advertising background, but from the institution, I was very fortunate. I had some mentors that really taught me, and I tell the young people, find a good mentor, because that was the life saving for me. So going to your question about joining the, called the Oregon Newspaper Publishers Association, now, almost every state has them, okay? California Association. So we, uh, we attempted to join the association 30, 30 35 years ago. Um, well, they didn't have, they raised the rates and didn't have uh, any room. So we, uh, me So let me just be clear, so they wouldn't let you in the association? Well, you can call it whatever you want, but <laughs> yes, they wouldn't let us in. <laughs> so, so what we did, you gotta, you gotta understand the demographic of the country. We knew that the West was growing. We knew that people was coming West, but we knew that we was up against Cal uh, back East, the major urban papers back, back East. So we ended up forming the West Coast Black Publishers Association. That was Oregon, Washington, California, Arizona, and Nevada. That's what we did. So, and we went, and, and what we did, we, we formed an association. So we, if, if the young lady here had a paper and we sold it up in Seattle for her, we, we assessed about one or two percent. That, that allowed us to, to keep selling, keep selling. And after a while, we didn't need them. So Nordstrom was one of our major, major accounts. That was the first one that we sold because a lot of people of color go to Nordstrom. <laughs> it's real simple. You go, and I have some demographics, and then I'll tell you how much people of color spend on these food, cosmetics, and a number of other things. So we joined that association, and uh, later on I became president, and we crisscrossed the country. Yes, crisscrossed the country. Interesting. Are you a member and of the... And that made us, that's made us where we are today. Are you a member of the Oregon Publishers Association today? No. Don't need them. Okay. <laughs> Joanne, talk a little bit about advertising. Um, if you've got 10,000 papers on the street, how um, are politicians wanting to come and advertise in your publication? Talk a little bit about how it works for Street Roots. Well, our advertising program is uh, kind of uh, through the kindness of advertisers. It's, it exists. Um, by people who want to support us. Uh, we don't have really the resources to have an advertising program, uh, but I think we're trying to just get better organized in that. So we don't have a lot of advertising. Uh, no, we don't get a lot of uh, political candidates. And that's, I mean, that's been traditional for print papers, print papers, for uh, print media forever. You know, they do radio, candidates do radio and they do TV, most bang for their buck. They don't, they don't do a lot of print. I, I just want to, sure. I don't want to leave you with the fact that uh, we don't work with them. They, the Oregon Newspaper Publishers Association, they, they, they do buy us now. Is that right, Jerry? Yeah, they buy us now. <laughs> so for the young people in the room, um, just a quick piece of advice, um, Joanne, that you, that you might give to a young aspiring journalist as far as getting started and should they even bother today? They, should they even bother yeah, today? Yeah, with the changes in the media. I think they, they, they better. I mean, I, <laughs> right? I mean, this is, you know, we're not talking about the death of journalism and news and information and facts. We're talking about different models that are exploited that tend to make us think less about news and journalism and facts. Um, those, those journalists are still important. Journalists from all backgrounds are still in, important. I. I uh, you know, and I know maybe it's a lofty quote, but I think of Philip Graham who said, you know, history is the first rough draft, or journalism is the first rough draft of history. And who's writing your history? Um, so they need to be out there. I mean, the scanner has changed this world. Street papers are changing their worlds. And the next generation of journalists are going to change our world. And they've got to be out there because, and I've said this before too, but that um, 
you know, uh, journalism on its own is not going to change anything, but without it, nothing will. So I really want to support and say every time if you're a journalist and you're out there and you're given the opportunity to do something new or try something or challenge yourself, just say yes and do it. Bernie, what, what advice do you have for the young people out there in the audience today as far as who might be interested in going into journalism advice and should they th look elsewhere? Oh, oh absolutely. I, I, I think journalism is a, is a wonderful a wonderful career. It's, it's like anything else, it's, it's changing. However, I think the young people today, and I said it earlier to them earlier, I think they are, they are in a super, super position. They understand all this new technology that's coming up. They use it every day. I just think that if I would say anything to them, um, I would say, uh, you might, might look at not only just journalism, but, but being a good writer, but, but, but on the organization. And, you know, that, that's, to me, that's what the power is. It's not necessarily you working for another organization. And I'm not saying not to work for an organization, because I think that's wonderful. But also, I think the, uh, the opportunity to control kind of your own destiny. You know what you want to write about. You know what you want to say. You, you know the importance of it, but also I would venture to say to, to these young people, take a good business class, lots of business class, because I think that is where it's at, and um, I think you'll do very, very well. And by the way, I have, I have a question to ask. How many are going to the march tomorrow, young people? Oh, I'm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> It really? So no, nobody no, going to the mall? That's a young car. Huh? Oh, there's, we got a couple of hands back there, yeah. You got a couple of them, huh? Interesting. All right, okay. Well, well um, both of your publications um, be covering the march Thank tomorrow? You. Bernie, you're going to cover? Yeah, yes, we are. We, we're covering it, and that's why I was there. But I'll be there. Um, I'm planning on marching, so. <laughs> because you guys are the ones that's going to change it. It's not Joy. us. Joanne, will you be covering it? Uh, we won't be covering the event because we don't usually do kind of that kind of news. But I will say in this edition of the paper, we have students writing about why they want to march, why they have marched. And actually, a class at the Metropolitan Learning Center interviewed each other about gun violence. So that's from their words, and that's in the paper that's out there right now. It's really, it, it's pretty interesting as far as um, I noticed that you did have coverage during the last I was, worked in Salem for many years, and you had coverage out of Salem. I think some of it was first-person column writers. Will you talk about how, whether your goal was to influence uh, the debate in Salem? And I'll start with Joanne, and if we have time, finish with uh, Bernie on that question. Um, well, we do, I mean, the advocacy elements of our organization for issues around housing concerns um, and housing rights, we do advocate for in our editorial, in our column from our executive director, Kai Sand, and also from uh, the Housing Alliance wrote a column, it, mm -hmm. I think is one of the things you're referring to. And what were the issues, some of the issues that, that mattered in Salem to your readers? And well, one of them is the document recording fee, which was instituted oof, like seven years ago, five years ago or so, um, that puts on the first page of documents that when you sell a house, uh, I think it was $20 at the time, they recently got it raised to $60, mm -hmm. all of which the money is directly dedicated to affordable housing, mm -hmm. particularly for veterans. So that was a cause that we were very mm -hmm. interested in. Another one um, being that they passed an in incentives to encourage subcontractors to go into rural communities and do the work. And they, they got some waivers on uh, some obligations for fees and just kind of red, red tape removed that so that uh, these communities in rural, outside of Portland, which is booming, of course, but in these rural communities, uh, have an opportunity to have electricians, to have plumbers, to have subcontractors get the work done, um, which, which has been a real challenge. So those are some of the issues. Fascinating, kind of some arcane subjects that might have been hard for me to pitch to an editor years ago, but if you make it real in people's lives, it's a much better story. Yeah. Bernie, what, um, what have you written about the scanner care about in the last le legislative session? Do you see influencing state government as part of your role? Yeah, yes, we did. We, it's a couple, couple of things. Um, uh, our, um, and I have just one minute, sorry. Okay, I, I was just thinking about a couple yeah. of them. So I'll, I'll, do, I'll do, I'll make them real quickly. That's okay. 
Lou Frederick in, introduced some, some legislation the other day, uh, this session. We don't know where it's going, but it's, uh, it's about the shooting. We, 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 are, we, we get a lot of the, uh, the killings and so forth. So Lou Frederick has introduced a piece of legislation that, that having a police, police every two or three years uh, I, I take a, a psychology test. Um, we think it's important because they have their problems just like anybody else. Leave home, mad, mad at their family, and so forth. So sometimes they take it out on us, so that's one thing. This week, we wrote a story on uh, Freedom by Memorial Trust, which it will be yeah, moving from, that. which will be moving from downtown and moving over to the Northeast, right on, on, uh, on Tillamook and Williams Avenue, which, which, is, which is phenomenal. And, and I won't go into the story on Lincoln Henry Johnson and some other things that a soldier that never got the Medal of Honor. And we did that for, for about a year and a half. And come the first article we did, there was a city commissioner here that called me up and said, Bernie, that, that soldier, that battalion was, was, a, was an all black battalion that was led by my grandfather. And that commissioner was Nick Fish. Huh. Wow. Nick Fish was the commissioner. Wow. And by the way, Lincoln Henry Johnson did get his Medal of Honor uh, uh, in the second term of Obama. Myself, Nick, and uh, one other individual went back for, for, for the honors. Let's let's go now to the uh, to some questions from the audience. Everyone watching or listening today is welcome to ask a question. I'd really like to encourage the students in the in the audience to ask questions. If you've written a question on an index card, hold it up high for the staff to collect. Uh, you can also submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag Friday Forum. For City Club members and civic scholars who would like to ask a question at the mic, please identify yourself as a member and ask one question in 30 seconds, which means no speeches, 30 seconds or less. The first question will go to a civic scholar. The, to the microphone. Thank you. Go ahead, please give us your name and your question. Uh, my name is Danny Nguyen. I'm here with Park Rose High School. Uh, so my question is, with a lot of youth moving to new so they can find for free online, how do you plan to re-engage youth to read uh, papers and stories that they can find in newspapers? And also, how do you plan to engage more of youth in the journalism world? Who would like to take that first? Oh, well, I'll take it. Go ahead, Bernie. Um, I really believe that the, the, the future of many of these newspapers is the people like yourselves. Uh, so we, we encourage young people. And I encourage, we have a, I, I think I mentioned earlier, we have a, a foundation that gives scholarships out for business and journalism. So we encourage people like you to go up on our website and um, apply for those scholarships. They, they range between $2,500 and $1,000. And, and, and so we encourage any of you guys to do that. Newspapers is like, as I said, any, any business, any other business, you, you always constantly shifting. And nothing remains the same, nothing. So you've got to be able to shift keep your, your, your revenue up at the same time, but also be looking for new opportunities because there's always different ways and doing this, you can't keep doing the same old thing the same way all the time. It's constantly changing. That's for sure. Joanne, uh, let me just twist the question just a little bit because um, we were talking at lunch about having young people who are reflected in your pages, who are writing for your pages. Is that one way that you're working to engage younger readers and a younger audience? Uh, that, that's one way, and we always try to encourage um, young adults to get published and get their words out there. Um, I, and, and I always encourage people to write what they're interested about because I think you come through with a much more passionate story. Uh, part of this, though, I have to think with that question is, you know, getting young readers engaged. I'm, I'm like engaged in young readers. I'm like, you know, the, the NRA, the, the gun violence movements that are going out there, the March Tomorrow, 
um, uh, Standing Rock, the Black Lives Matter, I'm engaged with them. I think it's, they're, it's phenomenal what's happening. Um, and I think we need to be covering those stories. And I would hope that they're, that that connection is made through media and the work that they're already doing to read about more, to learn about more, to contribute their own stories. So I, mean, I think there's so much potential and I, I think it just needs to be encouraged at every, at every turn. Mm -hmm. My name is Cynthia Harris and um, I am a member and my first uh, thought is an acknowledgement for Bernie and for Joanne. I'm an advocate reader of the scanner and I attend all the breakfasts and I truly know that Bernie does give to young people and I know that you do the homeless. My question today is um, surveys. So for these two issues that matter to me, what's going on with the youth movement and homelessness, how do you use surveys to find out what these audiences are thinking? We don't really, to be honest. Um, we hope to look more into what our readers and what our audiences um, is engaged with and how we can be more responsive to that. But I would have to say we don't use surveys. Are you talking about like, like organizationally initiated surveys on these matters? Or? About a month ago I was in Aruba and went at an international public relations conference and they were saying one of the ways to get news so it's effective is to use surveys to find out what people are thinking. And I'm just thinking I would like to see more surveys done for young people and homelessness. Duly noted, absolutely. Okay, uh, I can read a question from, one, from our audience uh, for either of you who wants to tackle it. The current political climate has made marginalized voices and stories, quote, in fashion, but your publications have been around for decades. How can we ensure the conversation keeps going and what would you like to see from the next generation of journalism? Great question. Bernie, you want to tackle that first? Oh, it's, a, it's, it's an excellent question. I, 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 what I see for the next generation of, of, of young publishers is their commitment, the fortitude, the willingness, and recognize that it's hard work. It's not easy. But I always say if, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. So I would encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. And I was just thinking earlier today how, how much you guys can organize a rally in two days and an hour and so forth. At my term, of, when I came along, uh, it took us a week to, to get this stuff turned around. So uh -huh. I, think, I think you guys are, are on the right track. I just, I just want to say that it's, it's important for you to, to keep doing it, keep having the commitment. And uh, I, I, I was just thinking earlier the fact of uh, the reason I asked that question about who's going to be, be rallying, because I think you, you guys are all going to change that uh, uh, some of the gun right issue. Uh, by the way, I am a gun owner. Um, I, I enjoy my gun. But I understand that, that you can't have these, these big old AR-15s shooting up all the other stuff. And, uh, okay. okay. Uh, Joanne, do you want to do it? Or we also have, uh, it looks like another question at the, at the mic. So, thank yeah. you. Uh, Anthony Petrol, uh, City Club member uh, with uh, Reach Community Development. So thanks to both the scanner and uh, street affordable housing issue. My question's around uh, how your timelines for publishing news has changed given that so much of our news is being broken instantly through uh, Twitter by our leaders. And I mean, we talk about how that instant uh, access to information is changing your industry. Well, and, and that, that's, a, that's a very good point. We still hold our old deadlines uh, on Tuesday, but also we know, we know now that we can, that cannot be a hard target. So we are constantly the advantage is that we are constantly updating our site and we do our, uh, I want to call it uh, our, what, what do you call that, Jerry? Where we e-blast, we, where we e-blast a thing that we think is very, very important. So we do do that, but it is, it's a constant change and you have to sort of change with it. I think, and you're so reliant on, the, on your print paper, but if you've got a really hot story, do you go with it on, online? Talk we have two platforms. We can, we can 
you know, bust it out right away when we need to do it online. We have, you know, another 10,000 people who follow us through uh, our Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and uh, directing them to our website. So, I mean, there's, I, I think there's smart ways of making sure that it um, fuels each other, you know, and, and, and at the same time, um, I, there's all kinds of media, and I don't think you, you know, we used to, we don't compare television news with print media so much, but we seem to compare Twitter and these instant uh, uh, bursts of information with print. Or, but but there's room for all of it. Um, you know, there's reading a 2,000, 3,000 in-depth story around what's going on in in the White House is much different than reading um, Donald Trump's tweets, right? So mm -hmm. it's there's always there's so much to consume and there's so much we need to consume. And there's all ways of doing it. And I don't think it hinders one or the other. OK, next question. Hi, so my name is Maya Fiaios, and I'm the editor of Lincoln High School Spanish magazine, Puño Letra. And this question is for either one of you. Um, so we see a lot of people reading news that only complements their own political beliefs. How do we shift these readers to alternative viewpoints or less biased sources? Well, for me, I think the readers are I, I think the readers are much, much more sophisticated than most people think. Uh, uh, for me, I think people, I pick up different newspaper all the time. My wife said, why are you looking at Fox? I said, well, I got to see what they're doing. <laughs> so, so I think people do look at different sources, whether they agree with it or not, but I think that's important. Um, readers are, are get comfortable in their their normal habit of reading their certain papers, which is good in, in a way, because I think what, what, what needs to be done as you as an as a owner or a publisher need to understand that, need to understand that readers are shifting and what you need to do sometimes is encompass some of that information from different sources whereby you can get your readers to see what they're thinking and, and what they're talking about. So we always, uh, put different things up. And it's, a lot of times, it's, it's against your own newspaper. But I think people respect that more than just having just one, one side. Don't you think it's a little bit about relevance, too, that you're going to capture readers if you're writing and presenting information that's relevant to their lives? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. And, and click the like button. Repost. Send it out there. I mean, it's it's a little bit of a mass marketing campaign, and, and we're, the, we're the market. Any question? Uh, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, I'd like to ask a question or a comment about how Street Roots uh, sells its newspapers. They have, you have 170 vendors. Um, the vendor, the, the um, newspaper costs a dollar. They apparently purchase them, is that right? And then, so they get income from them. And also you mentioned, which is really interesting, it creates a, a personal interaction between the buyer and the seller. So you wanna talk a little bit about the finances of that for people who don't know, and then the interaction? Sure, so vendors buy the newspaper for 25 cents uh, per copy, and I will say that the entire existence of this organization, they've, uh, they still pay 25 cents. And they sell it for a dollar, um, suggested donation of a dollar. They are allowed to keep whatever tips they make. Um, so we have vendors in all stages of uh, health, recovery, um, poverty issues. Some vendors sell 50 papers a week. Some vendors sell 1,000 papers a week. Um, so that's that's, there's no quota, there's no requirements, there is no minimum, there's no max. Um, so the vendors sell the newspaper. They uh, work with Cole Merkel, who's our uh, vendor program director, uh, setting them up in a location, a turf. We work with them to find the best turf for them. People are all over the city, but we want to find something that's close to them, something they feel comfortable. What's really cool is some vendors come in and say they've been thinking about this. They come in for an orientation, they sign a contract saying it's basically what you would expect you have to do on any job. Uh, performance. Um, so they come in, they have that agreement, they get an orientation, and then work with them in finding a good location that works for them. Um, so, And there's much more to it than I'm just glossing over, but that's essentially what it is. 
But a lot of our vendors today have really great relationships with their customers. If a vendor doesn't show up or goes on vacation, is gone for a week or so, um, we get calls, hey, where's, where's, where's Rob? I haven't seen Rob, is he okay? Um, so that relationship ripples throughout the organization and it, it is such a, there's just, there aren't words really to describe the impact that it has on people. Another question. Hi, this is Bobby Regan, a City Club member. Um, I think in my lifetime I never dreamed that there would be a term called fake news. Um, I'm wondering if you could just give us some general advice as we're looking at internet feeds um, on how we know that what we are reading is actually the truth. Well, that, that's probably a very, for me, it's very difficult. Uh, simply because I, I'm not a, 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 a computer literate person, but I do know that you you have to really just pay attention from where it's coming from, the source. Uh, one thing I, I have to say uh, that I think is coming down, it's, it's been such a such a real feverish pitch that some of the even the big platforms are now are researching their. Uh, their method of how to recognize people. And let me give you a good example. Two weeks ago, we was on a, uh, a conference call with Facebook and a few others, and what they're doing now is, is, is looking at news gathering organization and putting them on their platform. Well, I, how are they gonna work it out? I don't know. But it's all about now, if you got a news gathering organization, who is on your staff? or they trained in journalism. So they, they, they're looking at trying to put those at a higher, at a higher, uh, a higher research on their platform. So but how do they do it? I don't know. Joanne, you want to feel that you've been, we've talked about you've been in journalism for your career. How, how do people um, identify or how can they trust their news source? I feel like I should have a, a good answer to this, and it's challenging, but th there's all kinds of, um, there's tutorials even online that you can look at to sniff out websites that are clearly um, propaganda. Uh, there's, and there's lots of techniques that I'm not going to go into here, but I think that the best defense uh, against this is a really good offense in a way. So be educated and read of various sites, like you're saying, even if it's not an ideological fit with yourself, but to get a better understanding of, of what is going out there in a broader uh, view. That again is where I think papers like the scanner and street routes are so important because you get a viewpoint from a, a, a population that's not gonna be seen at other media so much. So I, I think you just gotta be savvy, media literate, and read a lot of stuff. And with that call to action, our time is up. Um, we need to pause the discussion for now, but we hope this is the beginning of an even more in-depth conversation for all of us here. Please join me in thanking our panel for being here today.